Hey guys, hey, love guys. guys. Today we are going to watch America's airborne anti-hero Jake McNasty McNeese. So I don't know who this man is, but he is an anti-hero. How but is this an anti-hero? man? Is very good storyteller. Yes, actually we saw that video last video of where he told about how the Americans well, just Iran, Iran. destroyed Iran's Haan. navy in very hmm. f- uh, very few time. So that was very good storytelling, and now I'm very excited. This video is about 35 minutes long. Oh, if if it would have been anybody else, I would have been like. Oh, would I be able to watch it? But he's a Haan. very good storyteller. Ah, but he's a bit fast for me. I like to hear stories, you know, like cozy and little peaceful. He be like this, 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 this. But, but the he's story still is not good. peaceful. He's no. still good, ha. Huh? So he's not peaceful. Ah, so that is why. And <laughs> America's ant airborne anti hero. And what is this about? And like, why is he known as that? So it will be very interesting to watch. So let's start this video. This is hands down going to be the longest video I've ever made. Oh. We should probably pee first. Hold on. We think the same. Oh, he's going to pee. Do you want to pee? Today we're talking about America's airborne anti-hero, ladies and gentlemen, James Elbert McNeese, aka Jake McNasty, the leader of one of the most notorious military groups of all time, the Filthy Thirteen. Filthy Thirteen. I think we have heard about this name. And just to clarify, in case you don't know, being an anti-hero is not a bad thing, despite how it may sound. You see, the textbook definition of an anti-hero is a hero that does not display typical heroic qualities, which honestly is pretty ambiguous, but it's one of those things where you know it when you see it. So, mm. for example, a regular hero would be somebody like Superman. He's invincible, wow. he shoots lasers from his eyes, and he always does the right thing 100% of the time. He never roughs up the bad guy. He always takes him straight to jail because the justice system never messes up anything. He only has sex in the missionary position. He always <laughs> changes the batteries in his smoke detectors on time. It's boring, uh, unrelatable, and yes. completely inhuman behavior. Uh, what? what was that? Somebody's there. Anyways, and then you have the anti-heroes, the fan favorites, the characters with human faults that they not only overcome, but turn into their advantage. Yes. Characters like Wolverine with his bad attitude, uh. Deadpool with his morbid sense of humor. Hell, even Batman is an anti-hero because at the end of the day, it's more relatable to do karate in your garage, dress up like a bat, and then run around town beating up clowns and dudes on steroids <laughs> than it is to be perfect. Yep. So I guess what it means to be an anti-hero is that you always do the right thing, but you don't always do it the right way. Oh. And if you were to ask me for a real life example of an anti-hero, I can't give you a better one than Jake McNeese. All right, here's the deal. Jake was born in Oklahoma in 1919. He grew up during the Great Depression as one of 10 siblings. This guy had to learn how to hunt, fish, and trap just to help put food on his family's table so they could survive. He had his first full-time job when he was 10 years old and continued to work full-time all the way through high school. After graduating, he became a full-time firefighter. Shortly after that, the attack on Pearl Harbor happened. America entered World War II. Oh. Jake, however, was exempt from the draft because he was a firefighter, but that's not what Jake wanted. Jake wanted to volunteer here, and he didn't just want to volunteer for anything. Jake wanted to be a paratrooper and a demolition man. Jake wanted to jump out of a perfectly good plane behind enemy lines with a couple of buddies, be completely surrounded, and have nothing more than a gun and some explosives, and just oh. go out there and deprive the enemy of What a brave so man. Bridge, guess what? Now you don't. Nice power lines. It'd be a shame if somebody blew those up. That's what Jake wanted to do, and that's what he was going to do. So at the age of 22, Jake set off for training. Upon arriving at training, Jake pretty much immediately establishes himself at being incredible at any task the army can throw at him, wow. but also a humongous pain in the ass to his entire chain of command. <laughs> During his very first week in the army, Jake got in a fist fight with the staff sergeant in charge of the chow hall because the staff sergeant would give him butter with his bread. At which point, the entire chain of command is like, on but one hand, bread. we have to get rid of this guy. He's huh. a loose cannon. You absolutely cannot be attacking staff sergeants as a private. He's got to go. But on the other hand, this is exactly the type of behavior we're looking for for someone yes. who want to drop behind enemy lines and expect to fuck up everything. So they just kind of let it slide. Fast forward a couple of weeks, Jake is doing a demolition course, and he ends up setting the course record. He is the fastest person to wow. ever complete this course. Wow. His leadership walks up and is like, hey, soldier, congratulations, you broke the record. Jake looks the guy in the eye and goes, yeah, if you think that's impressive, you should see what I can do when I have some butter once in a while. And that pretty much sets the tone for the rest of Jake's training. He's he absolutely crazy. crushes any task they give him, but also, Jake does not give a single fuck about the dog and pony show that is the U.S. military. He's not going to call an officer sir or ma'am. He's going to call him by the nickname. Really? He's gonna salute really? Him say salute him first. He's not going to stand outside and salute the flag during retreat, and he absolutely is not going to show up to formation on time, and he's definitely not going to be sober 
all the time. What about the discipline? Huh? In the Elizabeth army. Jake would be the only new recruit to yeah, not be the PFC, mm. which is a way bigger deal than it sounds like. Because at this point in time, in the 101st Airborne and the 82nd Airborne, every single new recruit after 31 days of training got promoted to private first class. Oh, the and he was not. That was, they wanted to give these guys a promotion so they can make more money and ideally send that money back home to their families because, well, They've got a very dangerous job coming up, and nobody knows what's going to happen. So mm. absolutely everybody is getting promoted to PFC after 31 days, except for Jake. But here's oh. the thing. Jake didn't really care. Jake wasn't there for the money. He was there for one thing and one thing only. We're going to be doing one thing and one thing only. Yeah. So Jake is now the lowest ranking person in his entire company, and leadership was hoping that Jake would take this as a sign that he should start cooperating and get it together. That doesn't really happen though, and leadership now has no idea what to do with Jake, because on one hand, he's way too valuable to lose, but on the other hand, they he's don't want to be with all the other soldiers rubbing off on them in a bad way. So they take Jake, they stick him in his very own platoon all by himself, and make him his own acting platoon soldier. Huh? And then as time passes, whenever they get another soldier just like Jake, they would send him over to <laughs> like all the naughty guys in one place. Platoon, counting him for a total of five, and they would become known as the Dirty Five. And from oh. there, Dirty things five. would obviously get really out of hand. Fast forward, Jake and his men finish the first phase of their training, and they are given a pass to go out on the town one last time before they have to go to Fort Benning for airborne school. So Jake and his men, you know, his men that all outrank him because he's still technically a private, but he's also somehow their platoon sergeant, they all go out, they go to the bar, they get drunk. They end up running into some MPs, one of his men starts lipping off the MPs. The MP goes to beat him with a nightstick. Jake interferes and says, hey, he's really drunk. Let it slide. In Jake's own words, and I quote, he's so drunk he couldn't hit the floor with his hat in 30 throws. Okay, so just let it slide. He's going to get his men back to the barracks. It's going to be fine. The military police, the MP, then tells Jake, mind his own business as he turns around to hit Jake's guy with a nightstick, at oh. which point Jake proceeds to beat the shit out of two MPs taking their Colt 45 1911s, firing all the ammunition into a nearby street sign before handing them back their empty guns and saying, okay, now you can take me to jail. The next morning, Jake's oh. main officer shows up to the stockade to talk to Jake, and he's like, look, not surprised you're here. Don't really care what happened. Here's the deal. The Japanese have the world record for the longest ruck march, and I want to break that record by having a group of guys march from here all the way to Fort Benning, 136 miles, and I think you and wow. your men are some of the guys that are going to be able to pull it off. Are you in? At which point, McNeese is like, 136 miles isn't a problem at all. I won't change my socks, and I won't even get a blister, which, if you've never been in the military, and you've never ruck marched, saying that you're not going to change your socks or get a blister on a 136 mile fucking ruck march mm -hmm. is an unprecedented amount of shit Actually, talk. Actually, yeah. 150 kilometers or such. 500 without having his tires changed a single time. It's like going out drinking, ending up at Taco Bell at 2 in the morning, eating a bunch of steak quesadillas, waking up the next day, taking a shit and not wiping, okay? It's just, it's not possible. So then the commanding officer was like, great, cool, I'll see you at the ruck march, we're going to go ahead and leave you in the stockade for the next 10 days, until then though, Jake's like, cool, no problem, I'll hang out. 10 days later shows up, Jake is in a prison uniform with a giant P on the front, and three MPs show up with 12 gauge shotguns loaded, and they escort Jake to the starting line of this fucking ruck march like he's Hannibal Lecter. There, huh? he changes into a normal uniform and takes off on a 136 mile ruck march to Fort Benning so he can go to airborne school. And wow. Sure enough, true to his word, Jake is one of only 75 men to finish this ruck march, and he did not change his socks, and he did not get a single answer, which I cannot stress to you enough is a superhuman feat. So Thank Jake and go on to do airborne training, absolutely no problem, nothing really of note happens here, except for the fact that Jake is still a private and has still not been promoted in any way. After completing airborne training, Jake and his men promote are him. to call North Carolina, where they are to receive expert saboteur training. They'll be receiving extra training in demolitions, they'll be receiving training in how to drive tanks, how to drive bulldozers, how to drive excavators, how to drive trains, pretty much anything and everything they could teach these guys to be able to wreak havoc on enemy infrastructure is what they're learning in Camp McCall, North Carolina. Jake and his men continue to do what they do. They wreck every task that they're given. It goes perfect. Jake and his men are now about to go to England, at which point they are given one last pass to go out on the town one last time before they ship off. So Jake and his men go out drinking. Somehow or another, they end up at this little tiny diner neighboring a train yard, at which point one of the trains pulls up, stops, walks across all the other tracks, and the conductors go in and they start eating at this diner. Jake is super drunk and he's like, 
I don't want to walk back to the base. I'm stealing that train. And that's exactly what he does. Oh my god. He just taught him how to drive trains. Yeah, so Jake mine to steal a train and <laughs> what is this man? To just outside of Camp Ball where he <laughs> I don't want to walk. Train, I'll steal a train. And goes to bed. But everybody knows Jake did it. Nobody's turning him in. So Jake gets away with it. Again, and now Jake and But he's very lucky also. He's lucky. So Jake and his men arrive in England. Hmm, at this point, Jake him has now. 13 men in his platoon, including himself, and they all come to the same exact conclusion. Oh, the English food fucking sucks, which is on <laughs> par with every opinion of it I've ever heard, which seems <laughs> weird to me because it's a country that took over most of the known world for the sake of trading spices. And yes, it's India. The conclusion that, hey, maybe you should put some on the they food. They should have but proper when, food. Because the food sucks, Jake decides, hey, I'm a master at hunting and fishing and all this other stuff. I'm just going to kill enough animals to feed my entire platoon by myself. And that's exactly what he does. The only difference is he has military grade equipment to do it. Jake is going out in the woods at night with a spotlight in an M1 Grand and as soon as a set of eyes looks at him it's getting blown to smithereens oh. Jake has his men going out fishing with explosives okay <laughs> they are eating everything a couple of problems with that so they're putting one, bombs in legs water rationing going on the soldiers are only allowed to have one shower a week is how little water they have to spare one so shower a week of his men I can't live like that hey we're just not going to take showers and we're going to use all of our water rations to clean and cook all of this game that we're killing and because now they started stinking they would all become known as the filthy 13 oh, the other problem that's with that how. Is apparently all of the game was technically the property of the king and the only people that were allowed to hunt it were the lords and ladies of the land which definitely was not Jake McNeese and the filthy 13 so Sir Ernest Wells ends up figuring out what Jake's been doing. He gets super pissed, ends up suing the government for like $10,000 for all the animals that Jake and the Filthy 13 ate. The entire unit gets in a bunch of trouble and Jake's kind of just like, eh. I mean, what, what are you going to do? I, I was hungry, so I ate some food. What do you want from me? If I'm in trouble, go ahead and punish me. What are you going to do? Stick me in an airplane? Make me jump out into enemy-held territory where a bunch of Germans are going to try to kill me? Oh Joke's on you. Do I that. that I want and that. The entire military is just kind of like, we have. We literally have no way to punish him. So he gets away with it yet again. Fast forward June 5th, 1944. The day wow. Jake and the Filthy 13 are given a separate and extremely dangerous mission of going out, capturing and occupying an enemy-held bridge that's supposed to be able to help Allied tanks penetrate further inland. After a day, they'll be reinforced from troops landing on Utah Beach. And if Jake can't capture and occupy the bridge, he is to blow it up so that the enemy can't use it for reinforcements. Oh. This mission is deemed extremely dangerous and borderline impossible, but leadership figures if anybody can pull it off, it's going to be Jake, Jake. and the Filthy 13. Mm. Because let's face it, the entire command structure at this point in time is basically looking at Jake's platoon like a fragmentation grenade of fuckery and bad attitude mm. that they finally get to yeet at the enemy. So after receiving their mission, Jake and his men go out to start boarding the C-47s to take off at midnight to jump into Normandy. At which point, Jake decides that he's going to whip out his stray razor and shave himself a mohawk. He tells everybody that he's part Choctaw Native American and wants to honor that heritage. However, this is Jake. He, he wanted a Choctaw, this kind of haircut. Had a lice this much hair. He wanted to go yeah. there with as little hair as possible. Regardless, his men followed suit and all shaved mohawks. They then began donning black face paint. At which point, Jake is like. This is cool, but we can make it cooler. So he goes over to the C-47 that had a fresh white stripe painted down the side of it to identify, identify friend from foe, and, and the paint was still wet. So he runs his fingers through the paint, and he goes around painting all of his men's face with white face paint as well. Unbeknownst to Jake and the Filthy 13, there were camera crews there taking pictures and recording them, and they would actually end up going viral, and the entire nation would be captivated by the unique and dangerous look of these men. See, everybody followed it. So much so they are so in tune with each other. The dirty dozen, and Jake and his men would be none the wiser to any the dirty dozen. Of it oh, there was a movie. June 6, 1944, Jake, the Filthy 13, and 18,000 other paratroopers take off in C-47s as they prepare to jump behind enemy lines before the amphibious invasion of D-Day. About 20 miles from the targeted drop zone, Jake's plane gets hit with enemy flak fire and is losing altitude, and they have to bail out early. Moments after McNeese jumps out of the plane, the entire plane explodes, killing some of the Filthy 13 and oh. scattering the rest of the house. So Jake lands, he's completely unharmed, and he has all of his equipment. The only problem is he's so he lucky. any other American anywhere near him. So he just kind of takes off. He gets in a couple of long-range firefights with the Germans, 
takes a couple of them out in close quarters combat, and he's just going around trying to find any other paratroopers to group up with. And it's going on for hours and hours, and he can't find anybody. And he's starting to think maybe the whole thing was a catastrophe. Maybe mm. it got called yeah. off. Maybe I'm the only guy out here right now. Yeah. What am I going to do? And he finally comes across one other American paratrooper, mm. and it's a machine gunner that lost track of his machine gun during the jump. And this guy is running around Normandy with nothing but a belt of machine gun ammunition and no gun. And Jake wow. is like, Jesus, okay, well, you're with me now, I guess. Here's my grenades. You take those. I'm going to keep my M1 Grand. Follow me. So now Jake and Grenade guys set off to find more paratroopers. So they keep looking, looking. They find some more. They find a squad of mortar guys. They find some guys over here, some guys over here. Slowly, Jake passes an entire platoon of about 35 paratroopers, and they're all going to help Jake and his mission take out this bridge. So Jake and his new companions start making their way to go blow up this bridge, at which point they would eventually come up on an entire American unit being led by this colonel and the colonel is like hey you're working for me now i don't care about that bridge i need you to go pull security over on this part over here mm. mcneese tried arguing with the colonel but the colonel wasn't having it he gave a direct order and mcneese is like okay fine whatever i'll take my 35 guys and we'll go guard this for you so mm. they take off headed there they get to the point they're supposed to guard, and McNeese just keeps walking because it was the same direction as the bridge. All of his men are like, hey, we're supposed to stop here. McNeese is like, you do what you want. I have to go take care of this bridge. You can come with me. I'd appreciate it. If not, stay here and guard it. I really don't care. All of the men go with Jake and proceed to make their way to this bridge. So Jake and his men show up to the bridge, they capture it, they build up some fortified fighting positions because they now have to hold it for a day until reinforcements from Utah Beach can arrive. So the Germans start showing up, they fight the day. back every time. One day passes, no reinforcements. Oh. Day two, they keep fighting the Germans back, holding the bridge, holding the bridge, no reinforcements show up. Day three, the Germans so are on the other end of the bridge with Jake and his men over here, and it is just no man's land in between on the actual bridge. Hmm. When suddenly, an entire squadron of P-51 Mustangs comes up and blows up the entire bridge. Oh. Because apparently the American leadership determined there's no way Jake was going to be successful in his mission, so they blew up the bridge anyways. Thankfully, Jake and his men would make it out okay. None of them were harmed in the blast from the P-51. Now, at this point, Jake decides, hey, we're going to continue to hold our position here because if anybody is going to try to cross this ravine, they're going to do it right here where the bridge used to be. Hmm. And sure enough, an entire German infantry battalion shows up on the other side of where oh, this bridge good time. At this point, the German officers make their way through the ravine and up to Jake under a white flag where they're like, hey, go ahead and surrender. We've got 700 men. You've got 35. Oh. It's going to be a bloodbath. Just call it a day. Jake, being Jake, is like, no. No, but you're welcome to surrender to me. The oh. are thoroughly annoyed. Is like, you're just 35. Courageous you man. 700 men. You need uh -huh. to surrender or I'm going to kill all of you. Uh -huh. I'm, sorry, I'm paraphrasing here. But I would assume Jake said something along the lines of, yeah, yeah, you've got 700 men, but you're going that way and the battlefield is that way. Which tells <laughs> me that all my buddies showed up on Utah Beach and they've been kicking your ass so bad that now you're trying to run away from them. So the way I figure it, you've got about three options. Uh, Option surrender. A, you surrender to me right mm -hmm. here, right now, and you all live happily ever after. Okay. Option B, you go back to your men, you hold your position right where you're at, and all and my get buddies show up in a little bit with a bunch of Sherman tanks, and you proceed to un-German engineer all of you motherfuckers. Huh. And option C, you guys try to fight your way through this ravine with me guarding it, which to be honest, I would recommend the least. I have the high <laughs> road, I have fortified machine gun positions, and you've got to make your way through a ravine first, meaning that I basically also have a moat. So, I will effectively be going so confident if you choose option C. Now, I'm not trying to tell you how to do your job, but if I was you, I would pick option A, because if you pick option B or option C, you have I can pretty much guarantee that the next piece of officer correspondence that you're going to get is going to be from a fucking Ouija board. <laughs> At this point, the German officer storms off with his hair on fire. He's absolutely pissed. Jake then goes over to his men and he's like, hey, uh, get ready for a fight. I'm pretty sure I just poked the bear. Oh. We'll see what happens. Sure enough, like an hour later, 700 German infantrymen proceed to take off and attempt to bump rush Jake and his men in their fortified fighting positions. Now, I don't know what you know about military tactics, but generally speaking, it is a terrible idea to run face first into machine gun yes. fire. It's also a terrible idea to try to fight the enemy when they have the high ground. If you don't believe me, mm. ask Anakin. Oh, I have but seen this. running face first into a fortified Star machine Wars. gun position oh. through a moat while they have the high ground and the men running the machine guns are under the command of some American with a mohawk, Native American face paint, who everybody calls Jake McNasty, is literally a lifetime supply worth of shitty ideas. Jake and his <laughs> men would hold their fire until the majority of the Germans made their way into the water, at which point they would open fire with four heavy cruiser oh, machine guns, then two they're gone. tubes, and a bunch of small arms. 
arms, effectively mowing down and decimating the entire German battalion. On that day, Jake and his ragtag group of paratroopers were credited with removing 700 enemy combatants from the field. Shortly after that, the reinforcements from Utah Beach show up. Jake goes over to a small town. They get put in a holding position for a little while. Then Jake's small group of ragtag paratroopers all get evac where they get broken up and sent back to their original units where they get regrouped and refitted to return to war. Jake McNeese would find himself getting evac all the way back to France where he would be reunited with the five surviving members of the Filthy 13 as well as receiving a bunch of new recruits for his platoon. At this point, they had a couple weeks off where they could drink, relax, do whatever. Jake's going out. He's getting drunk. He's having a good time. Then he would receive word that his platoon is going to be partaking in a new airborne operation referred to as Operation Market Garden, the largest airborne operation in human history with 38,000 paratroopers jumping into Nazi-occupied Holland. 38,000? Jake figured that he but was how going to be engaging in a lot of close Did you have that much planes? So he opted to turn in his M1 Grand and get a Thompson, which is exactly what he did. He then received word that his platoon, being the bridge experts that they are, were going to have to go out, capture a bunch of bridges, defend them, and or get rid of them until they heard word otherwise. Hey, look, I made a bridge. It only took me, like, what? And pretty much everything goes according to plan there. They jump in, they get to the bridge, they take the bridge over, they hold it for a couple of weeks, then they receive word that they are to go help another unit take over this town known as Eindhoven. So Jake and his men make their way over to Eindhoven and they begin helping to clear out this town room by room, building by building, close quarters combat, them versus the Germans. In his book, Jake described this close quarter combat as very different from what you see today. It wasn't four troops stacked up outside a door, kicking it in, and all running in together. It was one guy one room. An American would kick open the door, throw in a frag grenade. As soon as the frag grenade blew up, the American would then crawl in on his hands and knees with a Thompson submachine gun and shoot anybody that survived. The reason they crawled in on their hands and knees is because according to Jake, the grenade would kick up so much dust and soot and debris in these old buildings that you couldn't see standing at normal levels. So oh. you would drop down like you were in a fire truck. This was smart. Very outside. good to be able to see what they were doing. And this is how they cleared the entire village. Making their way all the way through it, about halfway through, Jake would be clearing a building where somebody clearly used to make furniture. At which point, Jake would find a chicken. Now, this chicken Chicken. had six eggs. Finding eggs in the middle of a war zone in World War II was a big deal. Nobody had eggs, and Jake fucking loves eggs. Okay, This is amazing. Only problem, he's gotta figure out how to get these six eggs all the way through this village without breaking them. So he thinks for himself to a second, he maybe did there only. He's here and I'll come back for him later. And he's like, no, that's not going to work because one of these other paratroopers is going to find my eggs and these are my <laughs> eggs I want them. So he <laughs> takes all the eggs and sticks them in the cargo pocket of his pants. And then every time he clears a room, rather than crawling in on his arms and legs, he slides in on one side, the side without the eggs, to ensure that, oh, that the eggs don't break. Eggs. Wow. It's the most gangster them. shit I've ever heard in my entire life. <laughs> this dude is going toe to toe in close quarters combat against enemies with submachine guns trying to kill him. <laughs> and his primary concern <laughs> is not fucking up breakfast. It's to protect this is eggs. Like a stupid video game achievement for when you want to play it on extra hardcore mode. <laughs> it's almost like this man knows that he has plot armor. It's absolutely incredible. He continues to go on, clears out the entire village, doesn't break a single egg. It's absolutely incredible. Wow. So we get to the other side of the village. Dad like, village. Sweet! We cleared out all the Germans. And then, across the field, out of the wood line, pulls an entire German mechanized unit oh, with 10 tanks. They were waiting for him. Jake is like, Now what to do? I just want to eat my fucking eggs. <laughs> this sucks. So Jake and the Filthy 13 go to work. Being the demolition men, it's their job to go around to the tanks and disable their tracks so they can no longer move. And then the infantry's gonna come in with their flamethrowers and cook the enemy out. And that's exactly what happens. Everything goes according to plan. They take out all 10 tanks. Not really that big of a deal. Jake reaches into his pocket. Tragedy strikes. He's broken. Oh! It only took 10 German tanks to make this guy fumble enough to break a single single egg. egg. And he got to enjoy five eggs for dinner that night. Jake and his men would then adopt a holding position where they would chill out for a little bit, hold their position until they got evac'd again for yet another huge mission where Jake and his men would find themselves back in France for a second time. So Jake and his men right. find themselves at an army base right outside of Reims, France. Obviously, Jake and his men want to go drink in town, have a good time, see if they can find some women, you know, what have you. 
The only problem is, apparently the 82nd Airborne was there last month, and the 82nd Airborne caused such an issue in town that the military had to bring in a special group of MPs to get the 82nd Airborne under control, and now Whoa. all paratroopers have been effectively banned from town. I mean, oh. to be fair, that's pretty on brand for the 82nd Airborne. Bunch of rowdy dudes. If you don't know, that's their logo. On paper, AA stands hey, hey. for All-American, but everybody knows that it actually stands for Athletic Alcoholics. Now, Jay, <laughs> wanting to drink anyways, comes up with a plan. He's got to hook up with a distillery all the way over in Paris, which is like a two-day trip away. So, Jake gets a 72-hour pass, starts leaving to go to Paris. His okay. commanding officer stops him and is like, Jake, what are you doing? I'm going to Paris to get some booze for the boys. Jake, Paris is two days away. Do you really think that you're going to be able to take two days to travel to Paris, go on a week-long bender, and then travel two days back all in 72 hours? Oh. At which point, Jake looks at the officer and says, and I quote, I don't know. I wouldn't be willing to bet on it, but... I'm willing to try. At which point the officer kind of just realizes and is like, is there anything I can do to stop you? Jake, not really. So the officer just lets him go because he realizes that Jake's going no matter what. It's just a matter of if he wants to get his ass beat over it or not. So Jake makes his way to Paris, goes on a couple day bender, gets a bunch of booze for the boys, heads back to base. He finally gets back. He's been AWOL for five days. They immediately throw him in the stockade for abandoning his post, at which point his command comes up to him and is like, Jake, we've been talking. We really want you to volunteer for Pathfinder School. At which point, Jake kind of has a little bit of a panic attack and he's like, they're trying to kill me. Like, they're actively trying to kill me. You see, if you don't know what a Pathfinder is, they're basically paratroopers, but they go out hours or a day before the big, huge paratrooper operation, and they jump beforehand, and then they figure out the best spots to drop all the other paratroopers and radio it back to base. Oh, so they know that is such a risky this job. During World War II was incredibly dangerous. On so risky. Operation, it required two Pathfinders and one set of radio equipment to get the mission done. And on every mission, they would drop 10 Pathfinders and two sets of equipment because they knew that on average, eight of them were going to die and one set of equipment was going to be damaged or lost. They had an 80% fatality rate on any one mission mm. at any point during World War II. And that is why Jake thought for sure they're trying He's going to get to him killed. Mm. The only silver lining here is they can't make him do it. Because Pathfinder is so dangerous that it was strictly a voluntary Volunteer basis only. Account. But Jake wasn't one to act too quick, so he said he'd think about it. And he goes, and he thinks about it, and he's thinking about the war, and he starts to think to himself, you know, Pathfinder school is all the way over in England. By the time they send me there, I start school, I finish school, there's a good chance this war might be over altogether, mm. and I'm not going to have to make another combat jump. It'll be great. So he's like kind of on the fence about it now, and then he really starts thinking about it, and he's like, man, Pathfinder schools had an Air Force base, and even back in World War II, the Air Force had way better food than the Army. So now he might not have to Far food, jumps, and he's going to get some good food. And then it dawns on him. The Air Force base where they teach Pathfinder school is eight miles down the road from Oxford University, and all the young British men are fighting a war right now, Meaning that Oxford is just full of college chicks. And as Jake oh. said, so in that quote, this seemed like a mighty fine opportunity. Everything. Girls, food. <laughs> I love this guy. Wow. So Jake shows up to Pathfinder School and he's immediately called into the commander's office, which is weird because he hasn't even done anything wrong yet. Mm. Jake goes in there. The commander's like, hi, Jake. I've heard all about you. I want you to be acting first sergeant. At which point Jake is like, I don't know what you heard about me. But you heard wrong. I'm technically not even a private first class yet. Uh, I've never been promoted. I am not the leader that you want. I don't care about saluting. I don't care about any of that dog and pony show military stuff. I'm here to fight a war, and that's it. At which point, the commander's like, that's exactly why I want you. I don't need you to salute me. I don't need you to call me sir. I need you to get these guys ready for war, and I don't think there's anybody better to do it than you. I'll he just sir, went there and became the teacher. First sergeant the entire time you're an acting first sergeant. To which Jake replies, I'm not, I don't really care about the money. Look, I've blown up every safe between here and Normandy. I have plenty of money, okay? I might be willing to do this job, but if I'm going to do it, there's going to be some terms. Anybody mm. that's fighting for me is going to keep having good Air Force food, and they get permanent leave whenever they want. At that point, Permanently. Permanently. Please, Jake is now the acting first sergeant, which if you don't know, is the polar opposites of the spectrum as far as enlisted rank goes. So, per usual, Jake excels at pretty much everything all through Pathfinder school. They graduate. Jake is still acting first First sergeant, and he gets to decide which person is in which platoon. So naturally, Jake does what anybody would do, and he builds a dream team of the 20 best Pathfinders out of oh, all 400 wow. and puts himself with that platoon. 
Now at this point, it's really looking like Jake might never have to go out on a mission as a Pathfinder because the war is really dwindling down. Yes, in 1945. December 16th, 1944, the Germans would launch a last-ditch effort counteroffensive to try to fight Allied forces. Oh. This would be known as the Battle of the Bulge, where they would cut off the 101st Airborne. Jake's old division, inside the town of Bastogne, completely surround them, and the 101st Airborne is now stuck in this city. They are running out of ammunition, they're running out of food, and they're running out of gas. And if they end up surrounding it can turn the entire tide of World War II. So all they need is they need somebody to be able to parachute in, get in town, and be able to call in resupply drops to let the 101st Airborne have a fighting chance to be able to hold off the Germans long enough for Patton to show up with his army of 350,000 men. So you've got a crazy mission, someone to save the day, you're calling upon Jake and his dream team. There hasn't been a single radio transmission to come out of the 101st Airborne in over two days. Despite that, Jake and his dream team are going to jump in anyways. They have to be able to hit wow. a two-mile diameter landing zone while jumping out of a plane that's traveling 160 miles an hour, utilizing oh. parachutes that they can't steer. This mission is seemingly impossible, hmm. but here they go. They go, they jump out of the planes, they hit the landing zone perfectly. One Perfect. man, unfortunately, does die, but that is a 5% fatality rate compared oh. to the average of 80. Jake and his men then immediately get to work setting up their equipment equipment in opposite sides of town. And after one guy calls in one resupply, he picks up his stuff, moves to a different location. Then this guy calls in his resupply, picks up, moves to a different location, and they bounce the signal back and forth on opposite sides of town all day sending signals for resupply. They do this because they know the Germans can triangulate their radio equipment and mm. don't want them to start utilizing artillery to take them out. Within the first 24 hours of Jake and his men landing, they called in 247 C-47s for resupply drops. They did a the very good day, job. They were able to call in 160. On the third day, they were able to call in 140. On the fourth day, they were able to call in 269. Wow. And on the day, they were able to call in 129. Jake and his men have single-handedly provided the 101st Airborne Division with enough resupply to be able to stave off the Germans to give Patton enough time to show up with his army and penetrate through the German flank. Effectively, he was always in very good like in everything that he did. And potentially saving the entire war as a whole. Not a disciplined so person, but very good. Today, it is now time to get out of there, get retooled, refitted, and probably never make another combat jump again because for sure the war is over this time. Mm. Right? Wrong. Apparently, Patton gets in some trouble, no. needs some hotshot pathfinders to jump into Prim Germany. Germany and call in resupply for him. So they're going to Jake and his crew yet again. Jake jumps in, saves the day for a fourth time, becoming one of the only men in history to conduct four combat jumps during World wow. War II. At that point, the war is basically over, and they adopt a whole new did not and die. It's just party in Germany for the rest of the time. Now, as fate would have it, Jake and his men and some of the rest of the 101st Airborne would end up taking refuge in the abandoned castle of Hermann Göring, like one of the Herman biggest Nazi Goring. leaders during World War II. And oddly enough, a bunch of the spoils from all the countries that Germany has invaded all found their way to his castle. Fancy booze, fancy wine, and apparently he was a racehorse fan because every famous racehorse from every country that Germany invaded had made its way back to his castle. So oh. Jake, Filthy 13, a bunch of other hundred They had a great time. Sitting there getting drunk on fancy wine, fancy whiskey, and there's like a hundred million dollars worth of racehorse sitting in the barn, at which point they're like, wow. let's throw on a rodeo for all the townspeople, right? Right, and that's exactly what they do. So you've got a bunch of drunk paratroopers riding around all these fancy racehorses. It's a great time. And then, my personal favorite part of this entire story, while out at the rodeo, Jake would meet an attractive young lady by the name Whoa. of Amelia. And Jake Amelia. and Amelia would immediately hit it off and start doing some postgraduate work. I mean, dating. <laughs> oh, don't worry, it gets better. As it would turn out, Amelia's father is the leader of the local chapter of Hitler's Youth, which is oh. just the absolute oh. cherry on top to this oh. entire story. How's the saying go, screw you in the horse you rode on? Jake's like, nah, I'm going to raid your liquor cabinet, steal your horse, ride in on it, and then bang your daughter. This is the best possible ending to this man's epic yeah. saga in World War II. This is how World War II ended. Come up with, and it happened in real life. Just to recap, Jake jumps into D-Day, Rex House. Then... Jumps into Holland, wrecks Rex house, house, and then eats some eggs about it. Then he pretty much single-handedly turned the tide of the Battle of the Bulge, mm. and then he proceeds to find the closest thing he can to a Nazi princess and show her that inches <laughs> are in fact better than centimeters. Oh. 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 Then reroute him to Arkansas so that he could see a plastic surgeon about getting his ear repaired because it had gotten mangled during one of his exploits. While in Arkansas, he would have a run-in with the military police, get in a fight with them, get thrown in the stockade yet again before being released 
the military police commander would inform him after he gets his ears fixed they don't ever want to see him on their post again oh. at which point Jake being Jake informs the military police commander hey if you ever see me again I'm going to be a civilian and you're going to be the one with the fucking problem because I'm going to kick your ass <laughs> at which point the military police commander files charges on Jake and Jake is immediately chaptered out of the US Army oh why so harsh on him after only three years five months and 26 days because that's just how it goes for the anti-heroes they're mm. absolutely necessary in a time of they war don't do anything and normally tolerated yeah. whatsoever during a time of peace Jake didn't really mind though he had accomplished what he set out to do plus he had a huge hoard of cash that he had liberated from all the safes that he ran across in Europe at that <laughs> point in time he goes on to explore his own alcoholism going from place to place town to town job to job just kind of doing his own thing. He ends up getting in a ton of bar fights, not because Jake instigates them, but because every local tough guy hears Jake's a paratrooper, and they want to prove how tough they are, but ultimately, the <laughs> only thing they proved is that they could fall down. Then, after a number of years, Jake would have a near miss with a drunk driving accident, where he would oh. almost drive his car into a concrete wall, in his own words, only missing it by a coat of paint. Because of that, Jake would decide that he needs to change his own ways. He would defeat his alcoholism, he would find God, he would wow. start going to church every Sunday, Oy. he would find a wife, he would have some kids, and he would live happily ever after, working at the post office in his hometown of Ponca City, Oklahoma. Wow. Selling stamps and slinging packages. Hey, this oh, is nice. none the wiser that their friendly neighborhood mailman was one of, if not the greatest anti-hero of all time. What an amazing story that we heard. And this man is actually an anti-hero. Like, normally what we hear is like in army there is always perfect discipline and everybody has to follow the discipline but this guy does not follow any discipline but still he is a hero and he's a kind of an anti-hero because he does not do anything normally also he doesn't care about anything he wants to do the things in just his own ways and also yes. he's a very stubborn person and you know to be honest i've seen in my you know personal uh, life i've seen that people who are stubborn and who are like stick to their own rules and principles they get what they want ha huh. yes they are uh, normally uh, get what they want at many uh, conditions also like they lose a lot of things and huh. in the end they might regret everything it everything has price everything has huh. price but yes they get what they want and this is how they are and like in this video also he was such a guy like he was like go let me like, throw me out in the war i will win it i will do ah. this and he always does that he was thrown out in four wars and still he was able also, to come out also that was also of one of my favorite part from this entire story was that amelia thing hmm. and i thought he won't get you know usually girls are like this stubborn you know attitude guys but in the end he got that girl like for me it was before the egg story was much more <laughs> because ah, he I got six eggs and he was like I want to take it with me and he never burst one egg there was only one time that one egg no, was I'm broken I'm imagining his childhood his mother would be you know like tired of him he's very yes. stubborn kid because that is how after, even after doing all these things he was still like thrown out of the army and then he had to <laughs> yes he was uh -huh. so like even though it, he should have been given a lot of medals for what he has done but no he was still because there was continuously his rash behavior was going on and on so what do you guys know about him do let us know in the comment section below so like share and subscribe bye, bye.